Welcome to Tennis Spin, where we put our spin on your tennis. Big show, guys. I got a special guest with me. Former ATP Tour Pro Andre Dome is with me today. Uh, let me give you a little bit of background on uh, Andre here. He was a blue chip five star recruit out of a Royal Grande High School. He played four years at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. He redshirted one of those years because he was injured. As a freshman, he was big, the Big West Freshman of the Year. He was first team All-American as a senior. He was Big West Conference Player of the Year, both junior and senior year. So a very, very decorated junior player here with me today. Now, what we're going to be talking about is what life is like on the ATP tour. Andre was on tour for three years, and he and I actually met each other when he brought his rackets to string with me at the Tiburon Challenger. So he remembered me. I mean, I didn't remember him. But that's okay. Everybody remembers me. Welcome to the show, Andre. Thanks thank for you. having me. Looking yeah, forward you. to it. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. Okay, so you were a highly decorated high school junior, right? Why did you go to college? You could have easily gone pro or gone to academy. Uh, yeah, so my, my parents, their whole goal was uh, for me to get a college education and they used tennis as a vehicle. And I felt like um, that was really important to me to, to fulfill that goal of theirs. So I went to, uh, decided to go to college. And also I didn't feel like I was ready to hit the pro tour. And I wanted to experience uh, the college life and get the education and, and all that and have, have a backup plan if tennis didn't, didn't work out. Um, so that's why I chose to go to, to, go to college and not go uh, straight to the pro tour. I do it for mom and dad, you know, and, and probably for your career because we know how many people actually make it on tour. Um, so during your college career, you also had a lot of success. Um, when did you know during your college career that, you know, I, I'm going to turn pro? Uh, turning pro was, uh, I, it was always a goal ever since I was a junior. Um, but I felt like I needed college to physically develop and get my game better. Um, during my college career, I, I played number one um, singles uh, every match, and I felt like if I was able to do that as a freshman all the way to, through a senior year, I would be able to play the best players out of, out of every, every school. Um, but as I got better um, and physically mature, I felt I, felt I, can, I can handle the, the pro professional guys. And every summer I would go play tournaments. Um, and I felt like there was also a development there where after my se senior year of high school, I went to play pro tournaments. I wasn't ready after my freshman year, um, I wasn't ready. And then once I was a junior and a senior, I felt like, okay, I can kind of hang. I was getting, um, some ATP points, um, qualifying for most of my, for the futures and challengers. Um, but probably the one moment that stuck out was, uh, after my sophomore year, I qualified for the Aptos Challenger, um, and I beat a guy who was a former former top hundred, I think, um, last round of qualies. And that was like that was a moment where I was like, okay, I can kind of do this, and that kind of motivated me even more for like my last two years of college to to get everything kind of ready until I hit the hit the tour. So basically, this kind of goes back to what uh, Coach Jackson and I talked about right? Dominate what you can dominate first, right? And then move on to the next layer, right? Like, like dominate college, then go pro, right? We got to We got to do it steps at a time. Going pro may not be for everybody as, as we learned. Now we see everyone, well, everyone sees Federer, Djokovic, Nadal, you know, the glamorous side of tennis. Now in real life, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. You don't become top 10 in a day, right? Like, what was it like transitioning from college to a pro player? Um, it, was, it was tough um, for me going to Cal Poly. 
um, I wasn't getting the level of um, the level the level of tennis that I was seeing on the pro tour. So it gave me it it took me a little bit of time to get used to that that level when I when I got onto the onto the tour. And the other thing is like when you're in college, you have your coach or you have a manager or you have everybody setting up your schedule, your practice time, all these things. And once you hit the pro tour, especially on the futures tour, where it's basically yourself and you're playing guys that are this is what they do for a living. And it was tough because you had to plan your, your eating schedule, your practice schedule, your flights, all these little things where you never had to worry about that on in college. And then um, once I got onto the tour, it was also eye, eye opening where I think my first trip, I, I went to Mexico and I played uh, a, a three tournament circuit where it was at the same resort for three weeks. And I thought that was a good idea. And then by the end of the third week, I was so burned out because it was the same food the same people, like it was just so repetitive. And I probably did, I did really bad those three weeks because I was used to college, like where um, I would get enough practice time. I would get the, see the trainer, see the physio, do all my stretching, get in a routine. And it was really hard to transfer that onto the pro tour at the time. Um, and I had a lot of growing pains my first year. Um, but once I got used to it, it kind of got easier. And, and um, and that kind of helped me get my ranking up. So. Wow. So not only did you have to manage your tour schedule, you had to manage your own personal schedule, right? Mm -hmm. So suddenly you're thrusted upon the real world, right? And then not only do you have to play tennis when they tell you to play tennis, you got to eat when you're supposed to eat, right? And then manage yourself too, right? Mama ain't there to do your laundry anymore, right? She ain't running your shower, right? You you on your own, totally on your own. So, so they see, everybody sees, you know, Federer has like the entourage, right? What's your, what was your entourage? My entourage was traveling with two other guys and um, staying in a hotel room with them. So uh, it was, uh, it's not as glamorous as everyone as everyone sees uh, out there with the doll and Fed and Joker traveling with their teams, so it was a, uh, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't the, I wouldn't say it was the best time, uh, best of times at the time, but looking back at it, it was, it was a great experience. Yeah, especially if you're young, right? You got to go yeah. through stuff I mean, like you, that. You get to, you get to travel the world and you get to do all these things, but uh, you're also having to play tennis, which was, which was a really hard thing because you could be playing the guy you're traveling with um, that week. And so, it's a little awkward when you're when you're <laughs> sharing the bathroom with uh, your opponent. So just to clarify, the two guys is not his trainer and his masseuse. They're other players, okay? That's what he means by two other guys, all right? So they're sharing the cost of living to tour around and play tennis. Now, I guess funding, right? I guess we go into funding now because you're sharing expenses now. How did you secure your funding um, like your equipment, your stringing, your clothes, your shoes, like to even go out on tour? Um, yeah, so with uh, my sponsorship money, I was, uh, I was fortunate enough to have a group of uh, people that, um, that supported me since I was a, like a little kid um, to, to help with my costs. And then another big sponsor I had was Tennis Warehouse. They were, um, I grew up in San Luis Obispo, so I developed a great relationship with Tennis Warehouse and once I played on tour um, they helped me out with equipment um, and yeah shoes and clothes and 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 that stuff and then so uh, Selenko took care of me with strings um, rackets I was getting them from Wilson um, and then stringing I would I bought a little pro stringer that I can fit in my carry-on not my carry-on but my check bag where it was probably like 15 pounds um, they're pretty famous on the future and futures and challenger tour because stringing does take up most of the cost where it's 15, 20, 25, 30 dollars. So, and you'd have to string maybe two or three or four a day. Um, and that, that adds up. So I got a little pro stringer and that's what, that's what I would do. I would finish my match or finish practice and then string up a, a racket. It would take me 30 to 45 minutes. Um, so that was, uh, that was like my nightly routine and I would go travel in certain places in Asia where it was a little cheaper, but um, 
most of the time I would stream my own rackets with the, this pro stringer I would take on, on trips with me. Yeah, guys, a lot. I've seen that little stringer that he's talking about um, a lot. And that thing is worth its weight in gold for these guys. Because a lot of the people that, you know, you hand that racket over to me or you go to the U.S. Open and you hand it to those guys at, at Flushing, right? It's about $35 a string job nowadays for the pros. So that's a cost that you can definitely do yourself. Um, so what about like the flights and the hotel rooms? Like who, who helps you out with that stuff? Um, so the cost of it was, uh, yeah. So the, the, I had a group of sponsors that sponsors that would, um, yeah, that would help me out with my, my flights and my hotels. But at the same time, I, Never wanted to take advantage of that money, so it was always the cheapest flights, the red eyes, um, the cheapest hotels, uh, and then I would try to room with other players, and that would help help a lot with the costs. Um, and then on the the U.S. circuit at the time, a lot of the tournaments would offer housing, um, so I, I would take advantage of that that opportunity where um, a member at the club that the tournament is being uh, held at would offer their place or um, their extra house or whatever for, for the players. And that would help a lot because, uh, yeah, I mean, a free night of free night of a uh, hotel, I mean, can go, go a long way. I mean, a free night would be maybe four or five rackets. Um, so, yeah, so the, so cutting costs was a big thing. And, and I pretty much did most of that um, on my own, um, reaching out to people, reaching out to other players, even if you don't know other players, you, see there you're traveling to let's say Asia and um, you see another American that you don't know um, in the drive you might message them to maybe room or cut costs and stuff like that and usually most of the players are pretty good with that stuff so when you say sponsors these are not companies but individuals right yeah like, so it was a mix of uh, certain companies and certain um, individuals like I had a clothing sponsor I was based in San Luis Obispo that got, gave me clothes and then um, and then other other people who would just give me uh, um, an amount of money, um, where I would um, I would send like a every tournament I would send a, like a updated email and stuff like that. So like an ongoing diary, so they can kind of uh, follow my follow my results and my travel. So so you're wearing like their patches or their hat or something yeah, like that yeah. just to help them out. You know, help me, yeah. help you, kind yeah. of a thing. Exactly. Right, right, right. So you started off. Um, as a pro in 2013, so you were ranked from what I saw in the 2000s. Um, by 2015, you had a high of 426 in singles and 488 in doubles. So in two years, you cracked the top 500. How hard was that? It was difficult. I mean, the like I like what I said earlier, just like the growing pains of college into the pro tour because. Um, if you don't get out of the futures tour right after you get out of college, you kind of sit in there and you kind of get into that mentality where you kind of want to jump into the challenger, challenger circuit. So I, I, I struggled there in the futures, um, future circuit, but, uh, the big, big breakthrough was, um, just getting used to everything, the traveling, I knew more players. So I just get more comfortable with at tournaments and I, I knew like scheduling was a big, big part of that where I, I would go to places where I would would have success, and then um, once you win some matches, the confidence keeps building. And I got in, into a really good streak where I think I won like two or three futures in a span of like six weeks. That um, that kind of jumped my ranking, and and I always thought like I was uh, I wasn't playing to my my ability when I was struggling in futures qualities and losing early rounds. So once I once I gained that confidence and and got better then that's where everything kind of got uh took off so i i couldn't find any information if you had ever um played at a slam have... uh no i never played in a slam i um unfortunately i i stopped playing tennis right where right when i was like um moving up in the rankings so i felt like if i kept playing for another six months a year i could have cracked a the qualities in, in one of the slams, but I mean, it's uh, yeah, it's a shoulda, woulda, coulda. Mm, darn. 
<laughs> Would have been a nice prize money if you lost in the first round there. Yep. Exactly. Were you, so you were on tour for essentially three years, right? So why, why'd you quit? Um, I was kind of, so I, I battled through the futures, um, qualities and I was, I was winning futures and then it kind of felt like I had to kind of do that again in the challenger circuit where you got to fight through the qualities and then get into the challengers. And, um, I felt like it was, a, it was time. Um, yeah, so I had a uh, job offer in San Francisco where, um, kind of hard to pass up and I was kind of ready to move to the next phase of my my career and my life so uh, I just decided to stop and I was a little I was a little too burned out at that point um, so that's kind of why so what would it have taken for you to keep going on tour um, I, I just think it was like a perfect kind of perfect storm where my head wasn't in the right place and I had a job offer and probably if the job offer wasn't there, I probably kept, would keep going for another year or so. Um, Cause I gave myself beginning of that year, I gave myself a year and if I didn't reach the top 500, then I was going to stop. But I, I reached that ranking um, and I probably would have kept going for another year or two. So, so in 2015, from what I saw online, you roughly made, twenty thousand dollars for the whole year and that was your best year right is that typical of a tournament pro yeah i mean it's i mean the level i was playing i was playing mostly futures uh, tournaments so i mean at the time a ten thousand dollar future you win it you would get maybe i don't know like eighteen hundred dollars take tax away so probably you're walking out of out of there with fourteen hundred dollars for a week so that's like not sustainable. Um, and then I think I won like a $15,000 challenger and I think made like 2,200. Um, so yeah, it wasn't sustainable at that level, but it's, it's, um, it's the, that first step. So going up to the a challenger, um, challenge terms, that's where you can kind of make more money, but still it's very hard to make a living. So you're, you're most likely losing, losing money to, uh, to keep, keep moving up in the ranking. So basically, it's like what Steve said again. It's like your top four or five hundred in your sport, like literally worldwide, and you're barely making or not even making minimum wage in tennis, right? Would you agree with me? Right? I mean, yeah, you're making much less than minimum wage. Yeah. So it, you have to love the sport and you have to endure. Um, so what? How how high of a ranking would you have to be in to make a living then? Uh, I mean, people say top 150, you can make a living, but I think top 70, top 75, it's, I think once you reach the ATP 250 tournaments consistently, that's where you make your money. Because even, even in the challenger, challenger circuit, like if you want to turn it, yeah, you'll make $15,000 if you win it. And, but you also have to take in the costs, like to get to that level, like you want to have a physical trainer you want to have a coach traveling with you so all these things add up um, and you're still I, I think breaking even at that point so once you're making main draw slams and ATP 250 tournaments main draws then that's where you kind of make money because then you have a 10,000 automatically uh, if you lose first round you know you'll have that have that in the back of your mind so it's not not really stressing and stressing about that that's why it's uh Getting into that top 70, top 80 is, is a, I think that's where you start making money. So if you basically made it on, if you make it to the four slams, then you kind of made it for the year, essentially, yeah. right? Yeah. What was your best experience on tour? Uh, probably my best experience was, uh, I was, I got a wild card into the Aptos Challenger and I got to play Marcos Bagdadis, which was a pretty fun experience because I, I mean, growing up, I, watched his Australian Open run, and that was um, incredible. Um, and he was always an idol for me, and he's always so fun to, to watch. So that was probably the, the highlight of my, my, my career. Did you beat him? I didn't beat him, but it was, uh, <laughs> it was definitely fun to experience that type of ball and just to see how he played, it, which, was, uh, which was pretty impressive. Um, it was, you got to tell us the score, man. Uh, I think it was... 
six one six three or six one six four. Yeah, right. so um, you're probably nervous that first set. Yeah, that first set was pretty nerve wracking. I, I think you can tell he, <laughs> he was able to. To I was like, let me just get that first game um, in the first set, and then it kind of settled down. But um, the second set was a little, a little, it was a little closer, and I felt like it was a, it was a, even though I lost, it was a really fun experience. Yeah, you calm down. That's that's, that's the yeah. thing. Everybody's hyped up. Hey, oh, I got Marcos back. That was on the other side. Who am I again? What's my name? Right? Suddenly you're down 5-0. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so what was the worst experience? Um, worst experience was probably I played a series of three tournaments in Sri Lanka, and I didn't really know what I was getting at getting myself into over there and uh they said it, the surface was clay but it wasn't really clay i think it was a mixture of what they said it's a mixture of uh like sand burned cow husk and i think uh cow manure i think that's what they that's what they said i didn't smell it so i i didn't think that was uh that was it but i was playing in one of the i think first round or second round and i kind of went for a shot and I tweaked my knee. Um, and this was a, like the first week of three tournaments. So I couldn't, I was out for the, that tournament and the second week. And then the third week I was just able to play doubles. So I was stuck there for three weeks. Uh, I mean, it's a great country. It's just kind of disappointing when you're not able to play, play any tournaments. So that was, uh, that was an interesting, that was an, that's an interesting um, story. Wow. That, I that is an interesting story. What have you wanted to, did you guys want to play on rap? <laughs> I don't think so, <laughs> but hopefully you made some money there. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, not. But oh, it was no. uh, it was a fun time. It was, it, was, it was it's a great story now. So exactly yeah. right. Um, so, what did you learn? What was the one thing you learned? Life lesson being on tour for three years. Uh, adversity, and you go through a lot of ups and downs. Um, a lot of downs, and like if you're if you if you're if you're on a circuit of three, four, five tournaments and you lose the first round of the first tournament, you can't just go home, pack it up and go home. So you had to learn how to how to hang in there, how to how to turn your luck, how to how to deal with that adversity and and just hope for the best where the next week you would have a better result or a better draw or something something like that. So um, I still use that to the day. Um, I mean even going through tough part of moments in my life, I just try to just try to tell myself it's gonna get better and just, just like tennis, I mean, you can't play um, a bad match all the time, so you're you're due for one. So I, I kept an open mind out there, and I I, tr I translated it to the um, to my regular life. So for all those juniors out there wa watching, wanting to kind of follow the same path as you, what are, what are your words of wisdom for them? I think the biggest thing is take take it one step at a time. I mean, your goal is always going to be whatever your goal is, college or pro or you should keep it out in the distance, but you should always have smaller goals where you can, those are attainable in a month or six months or a year. Um, and don't get too ahead of yourself because uh, every win you have is, is going to make you feel really good, but you're going to have losses too. So those losses, you should learn from those losses um, and take those wins humbly and just keep moving on and just keep improving day by day by day. And at the end of it, I mean, you're going to, you're gonna have a great tennis career, and you never know when it's gonna end. Like me, when I uh, when I ended my pro pro tour, and that was like my the end of my kind of tennis journey. But looking back at it, I, I wouldn't have uh, traded it for anything. All right. So, I'd like to thank Andre Dome for being with us today. Thank you so much. No problem. My pleasure. Thank you for watching Tennis Spin, where we put our spin on your tennis.